This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. I'm excited to see the realtor brands throw their day behind um, the iBuying scenario only because I think it marries some needed... I think it's going to be the easy ones that are they're going to be able to take down, but the realtors have the local knowledge and they actually have the long tail relationship focus where the Wall Street buyers won't. They just don't care. It's about scale. They don't care about our industry. They don't care about the buyers and sellers. It, it's just they're built for speed and that's, you know, it's hard to have both. So it'll be interesting to see when Keller Williams and the Realogy brands really get down and dirty. I think that's a way more exciting model. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I would say that I think a tool that has been given to real estate agents recently, which wasn't around for a long time. I know some people were doing this on their own privately, but the model of being able to pay for a homeowner's renovations in order to get their property ready for market so the seller can now net more money, the listing agent has a higher price listing and more buyers who want it and everybody wins. So... It's in Compass, our brokerage. It's called Compass Concierge. I know Berkshire Hathaway has a program called the Pinnacle Program, I believe, as well. And essentially, it's another tool on the belt through a real estate agent to get a listing. So I personally use this where uh, I made an offer on a guy's property off market. And it took a while to cultivate this. But ultimately, what got him to sign the listing agreement was that the my company Compass was going to put up the cash to renovate his house to get it ready for market, and this is interest free money. And as long as it's uh, no more than five percent of the list price, then the Compass will stroke the check. And as long as you bring the contractor and everybody's licensed, bonded, and insured, that now this homeowner is going to have a house that appeals to way more people on the open market. It's going to sell for more money, probably walk away with more net money than he would have gotten because, you know, you still have to pay back the interest-free loan or however much the renovation costs. You have a better house for the neighborhood. You have more sighted buyer. I mean, it's just, it really solves a lot of problems. And hmm. this type of model didn't really exist before. And it's awesome for someone like myself who flips houses that I can, I now go in with options. I bring an iPad in with me and I have, a full net I have a full net sheet, three different scenarios, and I have all kinds of data to show these homeowners and I walk through a property with with my iPad in there that calculates my renovation costs, whether it's you know add in window counts or you know uh, uh, flooring square footages and paint, et cetera, et cetera. And I basically show the homeowner on site how much I'm going to be paying for each one of these line items. All right, Mr. Homeowner, this is going to be a $50,000 renovation and here's how it all adds up. And you can, and you can see it because it's all line items. And I can say, look, I can pay X for your house cash as is no closing costs. I'll pay for everything. Um, but it's going to be at a discount because I still have to make a profit or B, we can list your house as is. And here's where I think the market positions your home. And here's what you'll walk away with net amount. And then, or C, you can renovate the property uh, and yourself, spend the money, take the risk, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then you'll walk away with probably the most amount of money or this last option now, which is, Hey, my, my company will, will pay to have your place mildly renovated. Let's get it ready for market. They're not going to do, you know, uh, anything too major, like a full gut. That's not part of the, the program. It's more made for cosmetics, but it, it's, and this option is really penciling out for a lot of people. And the Compass makes it really easy. And I'm not exactly sure of the details of Berkshire's uh, approach, but it's been it's been really cool to, to use. And I think I got the email this morning. There's been something like 15,000 houses recently that were, have used this program. And it's it's really taking, taking on. It's catching fire. Okay. No, I wasn't aware of the details. So the 5%, you know. If you're talking about a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar home, you know it's almost thirty eight grand, and I'm just exactly. And uh, what kind of stuff do they focus on as part of that? Typically, like what? How as far as maybe the the biggest ticket items that they would consider helping with? What would that be? 
So that's the beauty of it is that it's kind of vague. And I think that came from feedback from the beta testing phase because there, if it was too rigid, it, it, it would be a very difficult to do. But for instance, the one that, that, uh, that we signed on with the seller to do was we were doing like new stainless steel appliances, new flooring, new windows, new sliding glass door, new paint and, uh, countertops in the bathroom and uh, new tile floors and, you know, just a mild cleanup and some mild landscape. And, you know, that totaled somewhere around like 35,000 bucks. It was like a little over a $700,000 house. And so <laughs> that was the, the, the right amount to get this place to really show well. It had been listed before, Aaron. And then it's in a very hot market it's in Cardiff here in San Diego. And it, uh, and it wasn't going to, it didn't sell. And because of these reasons, it needed work. And so this type of uh, program was perfect. The homeowner didn't have to stroke any sort of a check out of their bank account. Granted, they just had to pay back for the, the fees at closing. And, and so, um, it's up to the homeowner, the agent and the contractor to determine the scope of work. But I think that too, if we're someone like myself and any other real estate investor out there who flips houses regularly, who also is a real estate broker, like we know what is, is being, is being done on the open market. We know what buyers demand right now. We know what will get you the highest return on your investment. And we typically have contractors who can do it for much cheaper than if a homeowner were to Google a con- general contractor, get a few estimates, probably going to be about 15 or 20% higher than, than what we, what we can do it for because we do enough volume with these guys. So well, it's, it's like, yeah, the chance that they'd even have experience doing it. So compass actually allows you to select which contractors you want to use. If we would like the homeowner ultimately gets the decision since they're on the hook for the cash at the end of the day. But when you go to a homeowner and you show them, Hey, look, here's our portfolio of projects that this particular contractor has done for me. And you can look them up. They're all on Zillow or Redfin or any consumer site you want to go use. And you can see the work we've done. And here's, here's the estimate and it's all line items. You know, feel free to double check it, but you're not going to find anything better. And so, you know, it's, it's that kind of like a warm blanket, like, Oh, you know, this guy, he's done it forever. He has multiple projects going with you right now. Why would it die? Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, I'll stop real quick and ask you this question. Cause I still get it um, all the time. Um, should I get my real estate license if I want to be an investor? It's a great question. And I get it asked all the time. And I think it, it has to be like asked, responded to with another question like what is it you really want to do like work backwards where do you want to end up in this game and and do i think having a real estate license adds a little extra uh layer of complex complexity the answer is yes because you now have disclosure issues you have you have to tread a little lighter and you know per the National Association of Realtors and California Association of Realtors Code of Ethics, you are held to a higher standard than if you do not have a real estate license. And so you have to make sure that you're operating that way. And it it usually comes down to disclosure and marketing. And as long as you're operating above board, I I think it's, I think it's a, it's a benefit for me. It definitely has been. And, And here's the biggest reason. So I got started in the real estate agent world in 2011. And in 2012, I was at Prudential California Realty, which then rebranded to Berkshire Hathaway. And the benefit that that has provided for me over the years is the relationships that I made throughout throughout that time with that brokerage has is paying dividends for me today. I get phone calls from many of those agents who are bringing deals to the table now on the investment side. They're like, "Hey, Derek, you know, I know you're, I know you flip houses, and I know you're really involved in this space." I have a fixer listing coming up. Are you interested? And it's uh, multiple deals were done recently that way. And it's just a gift that keeps on giving. So I really liked what I learned there. I learned to speak the language. I learned to navigate car forms and disclosures and, and everything, um, what have you. And I think the other benefit too, is you're working with other seasoned agents on the other side of transactions. So you get to see how some of these other agents, are conducting their business, conducting themselves, and how how they're responding to offers and counteroffers and development situations and 
properties that need to be fixed and what have you. And so it, to me, it's just a much quicker way to be an expert and to know all sides of, of the game. And for me, it's been, it's been really immeasurable and it's opened a lot of doors. No, I agree. I, I typically tell people if, you know, if you have no background in real estate, even if you have no plans of taking the test to be an actual realtor, I think you should take, you know, the three courses it takes to become an agent. If for nothing else, you just get to learn the language. I wish I would have done that way earlier in my real estate career. I think it would have expedited, uh, you know, you go to your first, you know, seminar and they start throwing around, you know, REO and you're like, what, <laughs> what does that mean? It, exactly. Absolutely, man. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think you can, you know, you can spend some money going to some private trainings, three-day trainings from a lot of the people you and I both know, like, and trust. And I still highly recommend those. But having the both sets of skills, I think, is important. And, you know, well, after a while, once you have a sphere and you've done some deals, you have a track record and people know about you, you know, even if it brings in an extra five to ten deals a year or just purchase or sales and you know you get a commission check and whatever it is it's a great supplement to the business model so in you know i'm 34 i mentioned that earlier i'm not going anywhere and my demographic is now they're they're buying houses now some clients in, in my demographic are already on their second and third properties or buying investment properties so as long as as i we still operating at a high level and are are still active, then they're going to be coming back to us. And it's just going to be a profit center for, you know, the next couple of decades. No, I, I completely agree. Um, let's get into a little bit more on the real estate brand. You've recently switched to compass and it's definitely one of the disruptors in the market. Can you talk a little bit about the compass brand and you know, why you decided to go over? I wasn't originally planning to go about this, but we get to cover lots of ground today. I like it. Awesome. Yeah, no, I love that. So the, the transition to Compass was almost a year ago today. So it was in the end of December 2018, and it was, a, it was a big decision for me. I was with Berkshire Hathaway for essentially my entire brokerage career starting back in 2012. I was at Berkshire Hathaway, and I didn't have, I still have nothing bad to say about them. They were a great brand and were very instrumental in my growth, but Compass the way I like to describe it is picture a Silicon Valley tech company meeting a Wall Street hedge fund that kind of, that mixes with a traditional real estate brokerage. And all three of those got together and had a baby. And that is how I see Compass is all the technology is top of the line. And I think the thing that makes them different is that although all broker brokerages would probably say this to some extent, but Compass really focuses on the agent first, whereas there are some brokerages that are discounting commissions and are, are just MLS only type stuff. But Compass is really focused on giving agents all the tools that they need to, to be that level of superior service to, to their clients. And so whether that is, that is um, software that we are able to share with our clients and have interactive daily discussions about properties or it's the Compass Concierge program, which I mentioned earlier, and that will actually pay to rehab a house. Compass now has a bridge loan program that will basically help you get the house you want um, with the house you have right now. So if you need a bridge loan to temporarily uh, bridge the gap between the house that you want and then the time it takes you to sell your current property, Compass will now do that for you. And so there are some, some requirements, of course, but it's opening the door for more and more clients and that we're doing it in creative ways. And it's just so cool to be in an office environment. It feels like what a Facebook campus w would be like, right? You have a bunch of like millennial savvy marketing minds running around and and coming up with new ideas and creative techniques and it's just really cool to be on the forefront of this and it's it's growing so fast compass is now you know one of the uh, it's i think it's the largest independent brokerage in the united states and it's gained so much market share and the numbers are just astounding so um you know i 
I, I say this from an objective point of view where when I first joined, it, I really looked at all the, the stats and the facts and just the brand itself and who was behind everything. And like it, it truly is a, a different experience on in the brokerage space. And I'm really happy to be a part of it. Interesting. No, I following all these brands and disruptors and I mean, kudos to compass. I mean, they came out of left field, um, in today's day and age, creating a brand from sort of scratch and the journey of how quickly they've caught on. I have a lot of real estate investment clients throughout California who have strategically switched to that brand. So I was just curious to get your opinion on, you know, why and (laughs) if you're happy or not. So that's great. And your web yeah, presence absolutely. is sick, by the way. Um, I was just visiting it the <laughs> other way. Um, oh gosh, what your website is? Uh, DerekHarmsGroup.com. Um, is that is that something that Compass is really big into? Is the branding side? Yes. So Compass has an image, and they have a culture, and which is one of the things that attracted me to them initially was that it's almost like a like an exclusive group that, you know, if you fit the mold and you have a production, then you're, you're part of the click. And part of that is, is the compass brand. And matter of fact, they have a term that they use is, you know, they take whatever brand you had before and they com- uh, comp- compassify it. And basically it, it takes, it's a whole revamping and it gets, you know, a clean, handsome, updated modern look to pretty much your brand, your marketing, et cetera. And that's what we did, right? We did a lot of on-site video shoots and, and photography shoots, you know, at Petco park and things like that, which I'm lucky to be a, you know, real estate partner of the San Diego Padres. Yeah. F- FYI, not everybody's door. probably going to be able to do the same photo shoot. If you go to his website, just letting you know now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you have to take advantage of the relationships where you can. But this, I mean, it just comes again back down to the relationship thing. It's a relationship business, but um, but yes. So we spend a lot of time on on building the brand and having a a really good web presence. Are you guys? Um, what would percentage of your business at this point is the brokerage side of the business where you're not fixing and flipping? I'd say about twenty five percent. Okay, and you know, I'd say about one out of four is is you know buyer seller client and it's i still love it i i what i love the most is helping people that i know and love either buy a home or sell their home and almost particularly for buyers even though it's a lower time return on investment when you spend time with buyers but when you spend them with people you you care about and these are lifelong friends to buy a property that will act as a wealth vehicle long term for them, it, it really helps them feel it, it really makes me feel good because the process can be muddy and there's a lot of people out there who are not very good at what they do. And so being able to to hold people's hands through this process, especially when they're acquiring real estate, is probably one of my favorite things. Well I think you end up getting a very unique perspective of how valuable a realtor can be um, and how valuable an investor can be depending on the situation because you sort of straddle the seats as well. So you have a very interesting perspective and you're a millennial. You're like a unicorn, Derek. Exactly. You're a unicorn. Right. I know (laughs) they they, they do exist. They do exist. Yeah. One of the last houses I helped a friend get into uh, a few months ago was a flip and we happened to know the flipper who did it. And so even though there were eight offers on the property, we ended up getting it through, through again, through a relationship. So it, it's her, and that looks really good, right? When your client's like, oh, wow, you know who, who renovated this house and you got us our offer accepted over all these other ones, even though other people paid more. So mm. it's their offer to pay more, I should say. So it, it, it all kind of circles back. And I think they, being a realtor and being a real estate investor harmoniously work together. And there's just so much that can apply to both, both, uh, both avenues. Very good. Well, Rounding it out, um, opportunity zones, accessory dwelling units, are, are you looking at any of those as part of projects in 2020? Absolutely. Uh, we have two in the pipeline right now um, with the city of San Diego. And in regards to accessory dwelling units, I have, n- I have nothing in the op zone, but a friend of mine here in San Diego is probably the largest opportunity zone 
player here in San Diego, and he's got a lot going. He's extremely dynamic, and he was actually one of the panelists on our NSDREI holiday party. But to go back to the accessory drilling unit thing, so we're seeing a lot of success with it. The two particular projects we have kind of hit some roadblocks, and they were density-based roadblocks, whereas in both scenarios, even though these seem like cookie cutter accessory drilling unit deals that just because the, the density in that particular area was, uh, was high. We now had to build a legal quote unquote third unit rather than actually get a third unit ADU. So these are both duplexes with attached garages. And in one scenario, it, it's a one car garage in a, in a awesome place in San Diego. As a matter of fact, what we did was we bought the duplex, renovated those first, and now those are being airbnb so we're cash flowing on those while trying to get this third unit pushed through, and we made it, we didn't make it through zoning. And, you know, in this particular case, it was one unit per 1,500 square feet, and we had a 4,600 square foot lot. So we were like 100 feet off from, the, like, not meeting the density requirement. And so they said, well, sorry, you got to build a third unit. You don't have any of the relaxed uh, uh, property line setback uh, issues that ADUs get. You don't get any of the discounted fees and the meters and et cetera, et cetera. So that essentially killed the deal. But what we did was we know that, and I'd love for you to talk about this if you could, is that these ADU laws were supposed to change January 1. I searched as much as I could find yesterday and today about what actually changed. And I haven't been able to find anything, but the word at the city of San Diego, and I have a contact who's in development services. I, I, I came to him a month ago and said, here are my issues. What do you do? He said, Derek, don't make any financial decisions until after the new year. There's Correct. going to be some new laws that are going into play. I think density is going to be involved in this. So yep. call me after January. Well, he didn't answer his phone this morning, but, um, <laughs> I, I'm curious to see how this plays out. Yeah, it, we we were warned earlier on last year, don't make any moves until the law is passed and until January because you weren't necessarily going to be grandfathered in if you had already started the project. So I hope that's not what you face because you technically already st- started having the conversation. But yeah, the discounted fees, if it's below a 750 uh, square feet, you should have very minimal, if any, uh, impact fees. Um setback requirements are less it's five to four feet now um yeah a lot has changed the the thing that i warn people on there's still going to be some outs for some cities so things like health and safety utilities historic i think the cities have come back with very creative ways to squash deals so everyone just has to be careful but (laughs) i I think you'll find an easier time now. Um, I was calling some cities before I spoke on ADUs late in 2019, you know, and it's late November and they're like, yeah, we haven't looked at it. You're like, okay, <laughs> you don't have that much time to go. But So if you had projects in the pipeline right now, Aaron, your advice to yourself would be pump the brakes until you see how this shakes out? No, I would go forward now, but don't buy something assuming you can build an ADU. I would really go in there and whatever city and municipality get it on record what their ordinances um the other thing that's really changed is that uh, the affordable housing goals the cities can now count adus towards those goals um so now that the state is trying to and this is something we'll talk about at sdcia as well with um, wykowski um it is they built in some teeth. So if cities don't comply, there's cities saying that they're going to sue the state um, because they've lost all control. (laughs) Um, I released my Forbes article um, during the Christmas break talking about that. They NIMBYs and the cities have basically lost control of development and ADUs. So they're not very happy about it. So uh, just because you can, doesn't mean you should, doesn't mean that you ultimately will be able to, (laughs) but just be careful, go in, really get to know the city and their stances. And if you're holding properties for a long time, I just recommend, I I just really want to know if they're pro or con because five years from now, if I make $150,000 investment, you know, they're going to mess with my cash flow later on. I won't be very happy. So just be careful. (laughs) And it's true. Opportunity zones too. I think ADUs could possibly work very well in tandem with opportunity zones. So it, it could be very interesting 
I'll throw one other thing that I know. If you build new construction um, and you're uh, in an opportunity zone, as long as the new construction doesn't have the certificate of occupancy yet, you can buy a new home and it will count as that doubling of the basis as long as it doesn't have the CFO yet. How I, I would be interested to find out, and I bet this would work, if you bought a property that you know, the ADU doesn't have a certificate of occupancy, that might work as well. Um, or maybe it has, a, uh, anyway, you can build something and in, in, in the ADU could count towards that doubling of basis could be an interesting play. So anyway, we have run out of time. I, I knew this was going to get beefy, but thank you for so covering so much ground. If people want to find out more about NSDREI, where do they go? They can check it out at nsdrei.org, or if you want to go to my personal website, it's derekharmsgroup.com. Nailed it. All right. Thanks, Derek. Hey, everybody. It's Aaron Norris with the Norris Group, and we'd love to see you out and about. January 14th, we're doing six things to succeed in 2020 with the Coachella Valley Real Estate Investors Association out in Palm Desert. Uh, don't forget to mark your calendars for February 1st, Turmoil by Bruce Norris, and I'll be there too. We're going to be covering everything from lots and lots of timing to legislation possibly coming in 2020. We have some very special guests that we will announce probably in the middle of January as we finalize the scope of the full day event. It comes with subscription to our VIP, um, meaning you'll have access to over 70 hours of real estate investor education strategically fo focused on California. Also, don't forget March 19th and 20th, we're doing the Florida Buying Boot Camp. If you've thought about doing some 1031 exchanging or want to know what it takes to get into another market, you might really enjoy it. Check out the norrisgroup.com forward slash training to learn all about our upcoming events in the local market near you. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE license 01219911, Florida mortgage lender license 1577, and NMLS license 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com.